All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. And welcome to this Cambridge University Press sponsored webinar, Broadening Your 2020 Assessment Toolkit. Uh, Jenny Blasi and I, Martha Altieri, are delighted to have Stephanie Giganti, William Lee, and Sammy Smith back with us again as guest presenters. Uh, these three have done several webinars for us and are very experienced classroom teachers as well as longtime CLC users. Uh, they always have excellent ideas and suggestions to share. And uh, since assessment seems to be on everybody's mind during this very challenging school year, uh, we welcome your questions and comments uh, this evening. Uh, Stephanie Giganti is um, at, teaches at Ridgewood High School in New Jersey, and Sammy teaches at um, the Master School in Dobbs Ferry, New York, and uh, William teaches at Tom C. Clark High School in San Antonio, Texas. And as you can see, we are using Zoom for the very first time for th this uh, next webinar series. Uh, this is the first one in October, and uh, we've got uh, two more scheduled uh, this month and then a couple more in November. So um, we are recording the session. Martha, wait one second. I'm going to mute everybody and then unmute you. Okay. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you. You are very welcome. So um, as I was saying, uh, we're using uh, the Zoom format for our October and November webinars. Uh, we are recording the session and uh, the link will be available in several days on the NACCP website, uh, cambridgelatin.org. Uh, we also will give you a professional development certificate if you need one. So just uh, email us at uh, clctraining at cambridge.org and I'll get that certificate out to you very quickly. And on that note, our three presenters, Stephanie, Sammy, and William. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about what assessment is. Um, for me, I think that uh, it's an opportunity to gain feedback from students, um, have us tell them how they're doing, and have students um, tell us what's working well for them. There is no better time than right now for that to happen. Um, everyone is very vocal about how we are doing uh, both in and out of the classroom. Oh, where'd William go? All right. Um, so, <laughs> assessment is, I think, truly the bane of most people's existence, um, in COVID at least. Um, so, um, our hope today is to talk to you about different types of assessment, how we can re-envision assessment for our current world and the limitations that we have, um, and to possibly expand upon what we do um, for assessment purposes. Um, Let's see, Sammy, did you want to try to share the presentation? Sam, you need to unmute. Yep, sorry. So we're going to talk about um, the difference between formative and summative assessment, um, how it can work both ways um, in this new teaching environment, um, how maybe what you want to focus on might be more formative because there are fewer opportunities for summative assessment. Um, there's still ways to do it. Um, and what we want our students to take away ultimately from the classroom. 
to me, that's fundamentally what it's all about. Um, what do I want my students to leave with? Um, and how equitable is what we're doing in the classroom? And now is a great time to start re-examining. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. Um, we're doing enough of that already. So I think it's really helpful to um, think about what equity means, um, how we're um, assessing students, um, maybe the non-traditional um, formats are working better and give us more feedback about what students know about Latin. And, you know, I think we're all sort of between a rock and a hard place. Um, and, you know, the rock is COVID and the hard place is we all still have grading software systems and administrators who need us to check things off a box and create some sort of arbitrary average for the kids. You know, I think a lot of districts played around with the idea of pass fail in the springtime when we were sort of up against a wall. And now, now that the push is to go back to normal as close as we can, they want us to have normal grading things. So how can we think about grading um, in our new era? Um, and, you know, some concerns that await us is, you know, the authenticity of an exam. How do I make sure that it's my student who's taking it and not his parent or a tutor or whatever? Um, we're trying to make sure that we're accounting for the accuracy of what the student is trying to put in versus what we're trying to um, assess. So there's a lot of responsibility on our part in that, mo in that idea. Um, there are so many different modes of assessment. Um, we're gonna touch on some of them tonight, um, and I hope that it's not too much new stuff because I, I know we are all swamped and we all have a lot of like new things coming in at different angles, and I'm hoping that it's a constructive experience for you to sit here tonight and you don't feel too you know, put out by the amount of new things that you might be hearing. Um, and you know, our emails were shared or are shared at the end of the presentation. Um, we're gonna be giving the presentation link. <clears throat> so if you have questions ex post facto, please feel free to reach out to one of us because we'd be happy to walk you through what we talked about tonight or you know, an expansion of that um, as it pertains to you in your classroom. Um, I think one of the other um, stresses on us right now is time. We do not have time with our students the way we used to. We don't see them for nearly as long. And when we do, it's always this like, well, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but it seems like a very fractured experience. It seems like a very rushed experience. And it's, it's, not this, it's not the same interaction that we normally get. So how can we make the most of our time with them so that it doesn't feel like we're testing too much or quizzing too much, but doing things that are more appropriate of or more appropriate to the idea of assessing them? Um, and then, of course, there are concerns about testing environment. You know, we have students who are at home, students who are in school, sometimes both at the same time, sometimes they're all virtual. There are so many variables. So um, I, I, don't, I don't think that any one of us has, you know, the answer, although I wish we did. <laughs> we could probably make a lot of money on that one. But, <laughs> um, but I think that we can speak to our experience as to what we've done in our classes and what we feel has strengths and weaknesses with the assessment techniques that we've done. Um, and then, you know, to what Smith was saying earlier, you know, there's a sense of equity um, of the students' access to the materials that you're putting out there. Um, because not all students have devices, not all students have the same Wi-Fi networks, not all students have two devices for, you know, whatever purpose you want. So, you know, we have so many things to keep in mind. Um, so, you know, I hope that if you have um, a certain circumstance that speaks to one of these concerns and we don't address it in our discussion that I hope that you can just kind of jump in either in the chat or in person and say, you know, hey, can you explain how I can make this work for, you know, a certain situation. I want to echo what you said, Stephanie. Um, I think it's really important that you feel like what you're doing in the classroom is um, enough um, and that these ideas that we are offering um, that they may not, again, be too much. Um, and if you are doing them, that it provides some kind of reassurance. Um, so, oh, you're back. Yeah. I, yes, I'm back. So as we're talking about technology failures and, and Wi-Fi, crazy Wi-Fi, so I'm so sorry, my computer Boot, rebooted itself. So please know that this probably is what your students may experience when they say, <laughs> 
I just all of a sudden cut out. So don't just assume that it's they're, they're intentionally <laughs> not showing up. Um, I like to think that the students are genuinely, they care and they want to be at school if they can. <laughs> and so, but yes, how I proposed was to have tech failure. <laughs> So let's talk about formative versus summative assessments. Um, and I think some of us um, are kind of tied by our district mandate and school mandate and what the administrations are looking for um, as far as the kind of grades that you need to put into your grade book, quote unquote grade book. <laughs> um, and so some of these games and websites and, and tools and platforms certainly can be used as either formative or summative assessments. Things like Quizlet or GimpKit. Um, you can assign things for them to do and monitor their progress. Um, Flipgrid, I know we'll talk about a little bit later um, with video and, and maybe using authentic input for the students. Um, you can assign Kahoot as an assignment and Nearpod and Peer Deck and Edpuzzles are all great tools as well. Um, and I think if you could go ahead and if you're familiar with Zoom, if you can raise your hand, let's just kind of see who are familiar with um, things like Quizlet and GimpKit. So if you look at if you click on the participant button um, and click on raise hand just so that we can kind of visually see. <laughs> okay, so a lot of people are familiar with all these tools. A lot of some people are not, which is fine. And so again, like I cannot stress enough that pick one thing or two. Do what works for you and your students. Don't try to do everything <laughs> as crazy as this year has been already. <laughs> we don't need to add to your stress level. So I actually want to share something quickly that I shared on Facebook. So if you're on the Latin Teacher Idea Exchange, you've already seen this. So for, forgive me for being redundant. But um, uh, GimKit just launched a new mode of gameplay yes. called The Floor is Lava, and the game is fun. Um, and my kids really enjoyed it. Um, it's a really engaging thing. They've got graphics and music, and it's like a really intense environment. And it's a cooperative game. So one of the strengths there is that you can use it in an environment where your students are at home and in the classroom, and it, it helps to bring them a little bit together, at least via a screen, to be able to participate in this activity together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my kids just played it on Tuesdays to review for their, their vocabulary showcase of wisdom. That's why I call my vocabulary um, quizzes nowadays and celebration of knowledge will be <laughs> there, the summative ones. Um, so GimKit does, okay, so if you want to have more than three kits, then it does require a subscription but it is developed by Josh F. Feinsberg, I, Feinsberg, I think is his last name. I can't remember exactly how to spell it, but I would recommend it. And he developed the platform GimpKit um, when he was a sophomore in high school. So imagine how talented and, and creative your students can be if you give, if you give them that creativity outlet. Um, and they do have great customer service as well, as someone pointed out. But the, the cost of that, it, I don't think it was that much. I think it was $75 for the year. So all things considered, it wasn't terrible. Um, but you can have a free, I believe, GimKit account for three. And you can't, um, if you want to play more than five students, yes. So. All right. I'd like to talk just a, a bit about Edpuzzle, too. Um, I know that a number of people have done a number of these different kinds of formative assessment tools, but what's particularly nice when you have a video uploaded into Edpuzzle, you can see how many times a student watches the video, um, replays it. I've been doing some Latin podcasts with students, and you can see if they're listening to the Latin again. Um, I, I don't care as much about how they're answering the questions I want them to answer them, um, but I'm not going to downgrade them if they miss it, but I do want them to make a concerted effort. Um, so it's, it's rough. Yeah, and I think it's a good indication too of how your students are do dealing with in-class activities. So if you know that they're taking 
you know, 20 minutes to listen to a five minute podcast, you know, then you treat your classroom activity in a different way to support them because they're clearly struggling with it in some way, shape or form. And of course, we're sometimes tied to our learning management systems with our um, summative assessment tools uh, like Schoology and Canvas and Blackboard and lots of um, nomenclatures out there. Um, so there, that's one way to assess them summatively. Of course, you can do more meaningful things such as projects or explain the mistakes that you have made or give them something that has errors and you can um, help them develop that growth mindset for sure. I think that's going to be the buzzword for a while is that, you, that we want them to grow. We don't want it to be where we're just assigning them a grade based on um, one performance. It's uh, it's not um, exactly a clear way of seeing how your kids are growing in their abilities. It's how well they did on this one assessment. That's all it is, but we want to measure growth. And if you'll excuse my Darth Vader cartoon, I thought it hit both the growth mindset because if even Darth Vader can practice um, in front of the mirror to get what he needs to, then any of us can, but it's also the darker side of LMS and all of this other experience. So I thought it would be um, a little bit of light hearted darkness um, in the midst of all of this. For me, everything that my students do is formative. Um, and I just give them multiple opportunities to assess, to assess, to assess. I am recording a grade for them. And as I record a grade, and I'll talk a little bit about this, um, if they're unhappy with it, the point is I want them to learn the Latin. So as long as they have that opportunity to practice and, and show me what they know, I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, I will say, I, I feel like when I'm giving grades for the students completing activities, I mean, I'm always pretty forgiving and understanding in real life, but in COVID life, you know, I, I feel like I'm just like, just, just do it. Like, I, I, I don't care if you do it in two weeks or today when it's actually due, like, I kind of just want you to do it. Now, that does though, I was just complaining to my husband about that this last week because I feel like in my grade book, you know, you go in to put grades in one time, maybe twice, but then, you know, you have all these little like things kind of dribbling in and, you know, you have kids who are emailing legitimately like, hey, you said I could make this up and um, my grade's not in yet. And, you know, so it does require a lot of maintenance to do it that way, but I'm, I'm with Smith on this one. I would much rather the kids just do the stuff and, and so that they're growing in their own time um, and that they don't feel like the technology is impeding them to such an extent that they're not having fun and that they're not really absorbing it. If, you know, because if, if all they do is look at the computer and just see this, you know, wall in front of them that they can't get through, they're not going to enjoy their experience. And then, you know, you want them to remember the COVID classroom for like, oh yeah, no, we were doing all these cool Latin podcasts. And I remember hearing about this instead of, oh my God, that was the worst year. I had the worst laptop and I never had Wi-Fi, you know? <laughs> so we're going to uh, break down uh, LMSs, um, our experience with LMS. Um, I've had experience with a few of them. Uh, they are both the helpful um, component in our relationship right now and sometimes the bane of our existence. Yes, and I, I'll say that for those of, us, those of us who just got thrown into a new learning management system right before school started, some of these definitely are the bane of our existence right now, for sure. Um, and so, um, then if you can go to the next slide. So I um, was thrown into Schoology at the beginning of the school year. Um, we were told to use that we were migrating from Google Classroom to Schoology. Oh, I don't know, probably mid July, but then we had no training until <laughs> the, the week before school started. And it, there were self paced modules. And so <laughs> it was a lot. And we I know a lot of us um, did not have time as a, as a district did not have time to develop and put materials. But as I'm looking at Schoology, there are definitely possibilities if you want to develop assessments um, beyond the traditional norm. 
Um, and so you can, um, and I'm sure the other learning management systems are the same. So certainly explore all your possibilities and, and again, think about um, how you can change something to fit into your learning management system. And, you know, and if that's not your thing, fine, then just assign it as a paper thing, as a Google document thing, and just have the kids answer the questions uh, on there. Um, but definitely, um, if you do have the time and um, want to grow as um, and add tools to your, to your toolbox, definitely play around with things that are offered through your learning management system. So. Um, Blackboard. Blackboard has um, an assessment tool that does not work for me because <clears throat> my grading tool, I don't grade by points, but if you are interested in doing it, when you click on assignments, um, there is a drop down box and you can go to assessments and you can create a quiz and it can randomize points. Um, in whatever way, um, it just always goes by points. And uh, because I grade everything on uh, a one point rubric, and what I mean by one point is not like everything gets one point, but it's like one uh, column where um, students fill in where they did worse or where they did better. Um, and so that's a, a completely other beast. But there are tools there. I know that um, as William mentioned, and as Stephanie can probably attest as certified trainer that um, if you go into Google um, Docs, you can create a quiz for students um, and get feedback in, in that manner as well. Uh, do you want to uh, chime in, Stephanie, before I start talking about uh, PowerSchool as well? No, I mean, our learning management system is Google Classroom. So, I mean, I, I could talk about it, but I think most people are um, probably more custom, and it's also not built in this way at all for this purpose. So you can keep going with PowerSchool. Okay. Um, I did PowerSchool for several years. Um, there are two options in PowerSchool. There's a traditional and a standards-based grading uh, component. And this is what the standards-based grading component was. I took a screenshot from several years ago, so there would be no possibility that anyone would know who my students are yeah, um, long time ago and you don't know what the class is. But um, you just enter all of your objectives and um, you can see patterns, which I think is particularly nice. So um, it shows me what I need to be working on with my students. So clearly my students are getting reading comprehension or they were like five years ago, six years ago, um, but we needed to work on different elements of vocabulary. Um, this is what I'm using now. Um, it, I have to pay for it, uh, but it's like $45. And um, the fellow who uh, is in charge is phenomenal. $65, I'm sorry, I misquoted. Um, he is super fast about setting stuff up. You can take a free tour to see if it works for you. Um, and he will set up whatever rubrics you want and build it into the system. So if you're interested in your kids having access to um, how they're doing in the classroom. If you don't have that availability and your school gives you some freedom for doing it, this is definitely an option. Okay, so as if on cue, because Amy was just asking about this. Um, so vocab, oh man, I know. The biggest issue, and I, I think you know, we alluded to this earlier, but I think one of the biggest issues is you don't really want to give a traditional vocab assessment in a computer or virtual format because the students have endless possibilities of defining the word. Um, and you want to know that their brain knows the word and not, you know, Google or their thumbs when they're texting their friend or whatever the case is. So it is a big, big issue. Um, and I, I don't, claim to have the market cornered on this one. Um, but I started this year to sort of re-envision what it meant for me to assess whether or not they were familiar with some of the vocab. So I thought, okay, well, I kind of want them to just be engaged in the vocabulary and I want them to practice their vocabulary as often as possible. I used to do this whole like elaborate vocab notebook thing. My juniors were thrilled because they had me two years ago 
And they were like, oh, I don't want to have to do that. I was like, oh, well, good. COVID took that away from you. <laughs> so in lieu of that, what do I do now? Mm. Well, I started using um, Quizlet classrooms. And um, I, do, I do have the paid teacher account. I will say it's like $35, but we share it as a whole department. I under, yes, so Jessica says they're adamant about not using the activities for assessment purposes, but my, I've, I've thought about that too, because I've seen that warning a few times and I'm like, oh, am I actually assessing? But what I'm assessing is, did they do activities? It's kind of a yes or no question. So I'm not assessing the strength of their score on the respective activities. I'm just assessing them on whether or not they were engaged with the vocabulary. So with Quizlet Classroom, um, I can track the kids' progress and how many activities each student has done with each particular vocabulary set that I have up there. Um, oh, good. So we're on the same page then, Jessica. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I feel like the average Quizlet activity takes maybe 10 minutes, maybe five, I guess if the kid is particularly bright, maybe 20 if it's, you know, a, a longer set or if it's a, a kid who gets, you know, distracted easily or something like that. So my mandate for them is you have to complete seven activities. They have two weeks to do their seven activities and then they get a grade just for doing them. Um, and it's, it's a pretty black and white grade. Like if you did six activities, you get 60 out of 70. If you did all seven activities, um, are you interested in possibly seeing my quiz at classroom and what it looks like? Um, or you, if you want to, if you want to raise your hand, since we have zoom, um, raise your hand if you'd like to see my Quizlet classroom. Oh, well, there's at least a couple people. So that, that's enough. Um, let me open it while I'm, I'm chatting about it. So I can track their um, vocab. And oh, so what I was saying before too, it is a $35 subscription, excuse me. And I know that that's not, you know, a small chunk of change for a lot of people. So I'm not trying to minimize the cost, but what I, I would recommend is that we have one subscription for our entire world language department. We have like 14 or 15 teachers who are all part of it. So our supervisor covers it because it benefits everybody. So I know that a lot of supervisors don't have a lot of extra cash lying around as of October 15th, but I think it might be worth the um, effort to ask. The other thing is too, because it's a teacher account, spoiler alert, they don't limit how many classrooms you can have. So you could open it up to the whole school. You could have your history teacher using it, your English teacher is using it, and then if your principal has to pay $35, but it serves the entire 100 person faculty, that seems like a more reasonable cost. So with that in mind, here's my Zoom thing. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so this is my set. It, it's early in the year still, and I can see um, all the students who are members. The first time you do this, it's a little tricky because some kids have, um, they usually have quiz, Quizlet usernames by the time they get to me. So now I have to do a little detective work to figure out which kid is which. You know, for the most part, I can figure it out, but Incredible the Twig, it's not his actual name. Spoiler. <laughs> Um, so I, it, ha it, it requires a little bit of, you know, work at first, but then the next, you know, grading time, it, you're like, oh, no, that's that kid. Um, so I can go through the members and I can look at each of the sets and I can look at their progress in each of the sets. So I can either look at progress here or I can go back to, um, I can go back to it through the sets themselves. So this is the set that we're looking at. Um, and for the stage 20 um, list that I pulled out, this is all their activity. Now, I can also toggle the timeline. So my assignment is every two weeks. So within the past two weeks, what have they done? This assignment was actually already due on October 3rd, I think it was. So um, this should be, you know, complete by now. So if I look in the past month, I can see what each of the kids did. Oh, there we go. It's loading very slowly. But you can see, so like this student finished it but did not, sorry, started it, but did not finish. So the check mark means they finished it. Now I could go in and do the anti Quizlet thing and look at, see what their score is and assess them on what their score is, but I'm not interested in that. And I think that by 
almost lowering that expectation, you're making it more comfortable for the students to engage in that vocabulary because they know that they don't have to get a 100. And I did have students who asked me the first time around, they're like, oh, what score do I have to get on the, the testing feature in Quizlet for it to count? I don't know, more than a four. You know, I just kind of want them to try and I want them to engage in it in some way, shape or form. Um, so, you know, like this student, Oh, the, the twig again. So he only did five out of seven activities, but it also says, see, look, his best try on this assignment was 100%. Um, his best score on this one or, la or last finished six days ago, he finished that seven days ago and so on and so forth. So I can track it like that. Um, but I could also, you know, you could give this to, a student, to students in a week and say, by the end of the week, I want you to be able to get a 100%, you know, and do all the seven activities. And, you know, maybe their grade in your grading system is not a 100, but just, I want you to work until the point of getting a 100. And that for me is, you know, it's one of those things that's going to have to be good enough for a while because I, I, I can't give them an authentic vocab assessment. Um, <clears throat> Whatchamacallit. So as far as the classes go, so as you can see, we have like a million classes over here on the left. My colleague, bless her heart, she numbered all of her classes because her last name is a little bit farther down the alphabetical rungs of the ladder. <laughs> I love it. So we have all of our um, classroom teachers' names and each teacher has his or her own sections of class. And then it becomes a good repository of um, information or vocab stuff so that when you are working on a vocab set for your students, you just add it right in and it's right there and the kids don't have to, you don't have to put the link to the set onto your classroom. The kids just know that it's always there. Um, I, I know we have some chats coming in. I'm not sure if I've been able to answer. Okay. Um, Gimkit, you get, yes, you can say how much they earn or how long they play. So that was the other thing I was going to introduce. So Gimkit also has classrooms as well. Um, and you can track kids engagement. It's a little, um, it's a little stickier on GIMKit because you actually have to assign each set to a class. Otherwise, there's really no record of the kid doing it. So the kid would have, the kid has to log into GIMKit in order for anything that he does to count. But with GIMKit, you have to create an activity for them to do it. Actually, um, Stephanie, so can mm -hmm. I chime in for a moment on GIMKit? Sure. Um, yeah. You can do the classroom as well, but you can just assign it as an assignment and then you can send the link out to the students um, because they, if they put their name, if you tell them to put the name on there, um, then you are able to track them. And so it doesn't have to be in the class. Okay. And um, I actually have some results pulled up. I can share my screen really quick. Sure. Um, and it, if you could share yours and I can share my screen so they can see the vocab review. And while we're switching screens, <laughs> um, I was going to plug, there's always Cambridge's vocab yes. uh, that you can take screenshots of um, and you can have students do it in a variety of ways. You can see what they've missed. You can have them type in the words. Can I also be a troublemaker for a split second here? Yeah. And I, I think the other thing is you have to always think about what is your purpose in testing vocabulary? Um, sometimes I think it's a way to get a grade and we all did it. Trust me, I did it too with the, the, um, the, uh, the, you know, the words in context. But the real goal is to get them to show that they can understand when they read. So I, I think we, we need to do as much as we need to, but not more than we need to. And that's just, you know, maybe to take a little burden off you guys too. I mean, you know, I understand. Because why do we give them all these things? We think it motivates them to memorize the words, you know. So take it for what it's worth. You don't have to agree with me. <laughs> Will you, may I uh, just piggyback off of Ginny for a hot second? Yeah, of course. I, I think we as teachers feel really comfortable in giving quizzes and tests because it's a checkbox for us. And it's a checkbox for our kids to say, look, I've taken my quiz or test and I did poorly or I did really well. Um, but the real test is what happens when they pick up a text and read it. Absolutely. And with GimKit, again, it's one of those fast recalls, but again, you can still, if you are tied to a great book, right? I didn't do the accurate grading by accuracy. I looked at, again, how long did it take them? 
um, and you set the amount, the dollar amount, um, and you can set it super high if you really want them to, to see those words over and over again. And so that's one of the things about GimKit that I found useful. And same thing with Quizlet and any of the, these platforms. <laughs> Yeah, so to answer Jean's question about that, I mean, it, it, again, it, I think it depends on how much how much time you want the kids to really spend with it and, and how many words are in the set too. So if you want that, you know, frequent, re frequent repetition, I would set your dollar amount relatively low. I've been setting it at about $5,000 because there are some kids who struggle. Um, and, you know, part of GimKit success for some kids is, um, is just their ability to buy the right stuff in the store and you know kind of get ahead that way and they don't get as many words that they get exposed to so you know i guess it kind of depends on the students it depends on the set it depends on how new the words are or if it's like a review set or something like that so you know there are a lot of things to weigh for that um but again i think you do need to keep in mind that kids are sometimes more savvy about the gameplay than the vocab itself getting to the gameplay um, and then Judy had a question about um, seeing how many uh, test questions they're doing in the Quizlet test feature. I haven't, you know, I didn't know that you could only do one question and that's between all of us and Zoom right now. Um, so I, I, it hasn't been a problem, but that's because I didn't know it could be a problem, um, but it absolutely could be. So for something like that, you might want to, you know, if you make this an assignment in, you know, your learning management software, where you say, you know, tomorrow is a due date for your vocab, you could also have them submit a screenshot of when they begin their test so that you have, um, you know, 30 questions laid out. Because then, you know, as you saw with um, the review of the kids' um, uh, activities, it did show their last score on the test. So, you know, you could always come back to them and say, wow, I can't believe you got a 100 on that 100 question test that you showed me, you know, like that seems. So if they know that you're making that connection, they might be less likely to try to pull the wool over your eyes on that one. Um, you know, for vocab acquisition at home, I am still and will always be a fan of an actual index card flashcard. I think that those are some of the best things that students can do for themselves. Um, and, you know, they don't have, you know, COVID's tough though, because their parents might not be shopping in stores or they might not feel comfortable shopping in stores. So, you know, there are a few factors to weigh in that area. Um, but I would say, I mean, it seems old fashioned, but the process of writing out the words and their definition, I think that there's something to be said for that. Um, and then, I mean, I'm happy to share my vocabulary notebooks, which are the bane of my freshman's existence. Thank goodness for COVID, because the current freshman, man, they, they dodged a big one. <laughs> and I would just say also just encourage them to read with all the stories that we have in Elevate in Cambridge. Just encourage them to read, reread, and tell them to, you know, like, Record yourself, um, not on the screen, of course, just send in the audio clip, you know, reading some Latin sentences and then talk about what they mean and what specific words mean. Um, but encouraging them to read, I think is really important um, since that's the purpose of Cambridge anyway. And so and I think that by reading a whole lot, that's the whole idea of acquiring that vocabulary usage. And so that's kind of authentic to me. All right. Um, so for Paula and maybe others, if you're interested, but since Paula asked, I figured I would share my crazy vocab notebook thing. This is something that the kids can do at home. Um, and then you would just have to have them take pictures of it and submit the picture as like an actual assignment. But this is something that you could do that's almost not screen time at all. Um, I'm going to expand my font. I tend to have a small screen size. So this was inspired, coincidentally, by my daughter's second grade homework. She had all these words um, that she was being introduced to as vocabulary words. And so they had this whole program. It's an elementary program. I mean, many people do. It's called Words Their Way. So this is words in their ways, you know, my little Latin take on it. So the idea for my daughter's activities was that she had this grid and she did 
any assortment. It had to be like, you know, five different activities or something like that. And she checked them off and it was like a little bingo board that she had to do with each of the things. And it was good because it taught her some time management too, because, you know, there were some nights where we had a soccer practice. So she didn't, she couldn't do one every day. She had to do two on one day or she had to do like a fast one on certain days. So I adapted this for the high school Latin classroom as best I could because I thought that her interaction and that regular exposure to the words was really important and it was really, you know, anchoring her to the usage of the words and their definitions. So my vocab notebook idea was um, each new vocab list was given every two weeks. So, you know, same time frame in general. And then they had a marble composition book that was purely for vocab. Um, and then they had to do a series of six activities within um, two weeks time. And then when they sat for the vocab test in the classroom, I went through and I looked at every single activity that the kids did and I checked it off and, you know, I mean, it was 60 points. So it was 10 points per activity. So, you know, it was pretty easy to get 60 points, but I was also, I wanted to I wanted to also show them too, that they weren't just doing it in vain. They weren't doing it just so that I could check off a box. I wanted to see them actually doing stuff with the vocab. Um, and so I, I think that that, I think it pays dividends. It's a lot of work for the kids though. And the first time they do this, they're like, oh my God, what is she asking us to do? Um, <clears throat> so some activities, and these are all like screen free activities. So write 10 Latin sentences with 10 different words from the list. I didn't grade grammar because I didn't want them to worry about whether or not their verbs were in the right tense. I just want them to use the Latin itself. Um, here's the old fashioned index cards. This is Quizlet, so that's a, a screen thing. Um, create a handwritten 20 question quiz for somebody else. And I specified that it has to have choose the best word, um, multiple choice and matching. Um, and true false was not an option. Although the kids, the kids thought that that was like a viable option. Like weird means man, true or false. I'm like, really? <laughs> anyway, um, I also thought, you know, my, at the high school level, parents are starting to kind of pull away from their students and vice versa. So I wanted to pull them, push them back together for, you know, 10 minutes a week or something like that. So I had the family member quiz where, you know, you had to sit with a member of your family and they could quiz you on the words and then they had to sign off in your notebook. Um, developing a list of Latin synonyms and antonyms. I wanted them to think in a horizontal way about their vocabulary and learn to associate different things. And I, I know that a lot of my kids just ended up like just using a dictionary and looking it up and looking for other words, but it also forced them to think about other ways of thinking about the word dirt so that they could find other words that had something to do with dirt, but weren't actually the word dirt because there's only one Latin word for dirt. So, you know, little things like that um, to kind of broaden their awareness of vocab. Um, there were illustrations because I know that there are a lot of kids who are artistically oriented. Um, English derivatives, I know those are pretty standard for most of us. Um, telling a story in either Latin or English. I actually had a number of kids who wrote stories entirely in Latin and I didn't worry about what their grammar was. I just, I loved that they wanted to like throw themselves into it. Um, so they would tell a story in English and then just pop the Latin word in wherever it was appropriate. Um, I had them either create by hand so not on a screen, either a crossword puzzle or a word search. And then their clues and their answers had to be the separate languages. So the crossword puzzle would have, you know, man and the clue would be weir. Um, and then the same for um, word search. I also used the old fashioned fourfold vocab sheet that focuses on repetition of like just writing out all the Latin words and then flipping over the page, trying to define them and so on and so forth. Um, and then, and this was an idea I got from ACL actually um, in 2019 when it was in, not 2019, yeah, 2019 when it was in the city, um, a falsy amici list. So this was actually a cool exercise because I wanted kids to look at similar words that were not the same um, and encourage them to develop like a, oops, I don't want to get it mis mistaken with, you know, something else. Um, and then this study blue is just another website, but I hope that seeing this has been, um, you know, demonstrative of some of the things that you could ask your students to do. The flip side in COVID is that it does require the kids taking, you know, six to 10 pictures and then submitting them um, in, in, you know, some sort of LMS or some assignment that it might be a little bit cumbersome for them, but it's certainly doable.
Um, if I could uh, just interject, I think I wish that we had better terminology that we hadn't collapsed the word assessment with evaluation um, because everything that we're doing is assessing students. It's telling us how they're, how they're doing, how quickly they're picking up on words. And so when we put it in a grade book, it is both giving feedback and it is evaluative. But you can do things without putting it in a grade book or do things and put it in a grade book and not hold them completely accountable all the time. Oh, okay. So yes, me, Edulastic. So um, before you go on, some people want yeah. to know with your board, how many do they have to do? Six. Okay. Thank yeah. Um, and um, yeah. Okay. If anybody else has any questions about my vocab thing for something kind of low techy, um, so. Let's go from low tech to high tech. <laughs> so um, one of the questions that I've gotten from a number of the colleagues at my school is, you know, I do this activity on paper every year and I want to be able to do it, but I can't do paper and we can't share it and stuff like that. And I even ran into the same problem um, in stage 20. I have them read a story and I, I mean, I already have it all set up. I have this, you know, Google Doc, but I already have all the pieces cut out. They have to rearrange the sentences from the story. And I'm like, how am I going to do that? So um, I turn to Edulastic, which is um, going to be your new friend as well. Edulastic is one of those things that's mostly free. Um, it does have some premium features, but I've been able to get by for a few years on just the free stuff. Um, I will say Edulastic, technically speaking, is geared much more for math and English, but you can create customized activities for anything. So whatever you have, you're just putting the content into these activity templates through Edulastic. It syncs with Google Classroom. I, I don't know about its synchronicity with other LMSs, um, but it definitely plays very nicely with Google Classroom and it tracks their accuracy and their progress with a certain activity. So that it's not just like they got it correct, but you can assign it repeatedly um, and the students can show improvement over time. So um, let's take a look at it. I have, um, I was going to kind of walk you through it a little bit. Um, so if you don't mind unsharing your screen and then I will share my Edulastic screen. Thanks. Okay. So Edulastic has a number of different features to it. Um, you're probably gonna look at it and say, oh wow, I'm gonna play around with that this weekend. So I'm gonna try to give you an overview because I also know it's 10 to eight and I, I don't wanna um, keep you too long on just this one isolated topic. Um, Let me say we are gonna let this run past eight o'clock. Okay. And, and so that we have it on recording. And uh, so, so don't feel too stressed. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, all right, I thought I was already signed in, sorry. So I'm gonna sign in, it's gonna take me to a dashboard. Um, I don't actually teach algebra. I know I look like a math teacher too, I don't. Um, I'm, I supervise another teacher's algebra class and because she uses Google Classroom, she made me a co-teacher and Edulastic just understands that I'm part of the package. So I don't actually teach it. So this is my um, Latin two class. I have one assignment that's currently going on. This is the Astrologus Victor story that I talked to you about earlier. So what I ended up doing for this activity, um, and I'll show you how I did it, um, perhaps if I have time, but what I did was I recorded myself um, separately reading through the text because we had done it in class, but I wanted to make sure they had like a final copy. So I recorded a quick screencast of myself just reading through it, and then I put that as like the prompt. And then I said, okay, listen to this story as many times as you need to, and then rearrange all the sentences in the story so that they're in, you know, the most logical way. The catch with something like Edulastic, though, is it's very algorithm based. So if my students did not have 100% all the sentences correct in the exact correct order, it said that they were wrong. So, you know, but I, I still value it because it's still good input for me to see where their brains were and how much they understood or how much they didn't understand, regardless of what their actual score is. So, and I think this kind of goes back to one of our first points of using assessment in more of an evaluative way, um, as Smith was just saying, versus like, you know, just doing it for the sake of a grade that goes into your learning management system. 
So um, I'm going to show you how to make assignments. Um, and I think, you know, I hope I'm going to give you enough of like a basis to start your own Edulastic stuff if you want to. Um, I just need to move my Zoom thing. Okay, so when I click on new assignment, um, you can choose from a library, but because we're Latin and, and Edulastic is a very math oriented software, I would not recommend choosing it from the library. Although there are some things that are there from other languages and whatnot, I would just do your own thing. <laughs> so. You're going to click on author a test and then create from scratch. It does have the ability to take a PDF and use that as the basis for questions, um, but I haven't really had a chance to try it out yet because it tends to just be like a static PDF, like here's a PDF and then you answer questions separately. And to be honest, if you're going to be using PDFs for student activities, I would much prefer using a software like either DocHub or Kami because those are more annotative than Edulastic is. So I'm going to create a test. Edulastic's terminology is a little weird. I'm not making like an actual test. I'm just making like an activity. So, you know, I'll call it the October 8th activity that I'm going to make. So um, then you would enter a description. It does want to know the grade level. Um, and subject, we've just become other. I'm sorry, my friends. Um, then I can click on add items and add items is where you get to all the different questions. So this is the entire library of questions that exist for grade nine other subjects. Clearly they're not Latin oriented. <laughs> um, if I were to click on authored by me, I'll see a few that I've created over the years for a variety of different things. I have to say my edulastic use had waned in the last couple of years because, um, well, for a couple different reasons, but also because I didn't really need to, because I still had the ability to do a lot of the stuff in the classroom and I took it for granted too long. Um, but you probably won't find something here. So you're going to go up to create new item in the upper right hand corner. And this is where you get to all the fun stuff. So this is um, standard multiple choice. Um, this is multiple selection within multiple choice. And, and I know what you're thinking. Well, Google Forms does this too. I realize that. Um, this one has a different layout. This one has the table. And I know these are all things that Google Forms already does. So I, I will grant you that. It doesn't have something like fill in the blanks though. So this is a drag and drop fill in the blank where you would drag this word up here and drag that word up here. So this would be a great interactive close activity. Um, you could also do a close activity with a text drop down where you have all the words um, that should be in the close paragraph kind of lined, uh, lined up here underneath the drop down menu. You could do close with just like text entry boxes rather than just like the typical lines that you put in a document. Um, there, is, there are options for using images as the backdrop, um, you know, doing drag and drop. So this would be if the terms were here and I had to drag them to different places on the map. This would be if I had the map as the background and then over this country, I had like a drop down menu, sort of like this one. And then this is putting like um, empty boxes all over the map and then just having the students type in whatever they wanted to identify. Um, and then there's an editing task as well. I haven't really delved into that one too much. Um, with classify match and order, this is what I was doing with my Astrologus Quick Tour activity. So I was resequencing. And basically you put in all of your sentences. Um, you have to mix it up. So, you know, it's a little primitive, I guess, that way. Um, but once you mix them up, it's, it's set. And then you also, if you put them in in the correct order, um, it'll automatically log that as the answer key. And then you can, you know, flip it in the actual question. Um, and then, you know, this is a great sorting list activity. So this is kind of like what they do in Elevate, except you have it in Edulastic format. Um, classifications would work great, you know, especially in the early days of Latin one where they're trying to differentiate nouns from verbs and, you know, uh, and adverbs and things like that. Um, this is some, you know, matching activities as well. And then they do have some writing activities too, um, in terms of short answer stuff, um, passage, um, sorry, passage based things as well. Um, and since we're Latin teachers, we don't need the other half of what's down here. So um, if I were to do, you know, a label image with drop down, um, then it gives me the option of how many things I want, 
Um, these are the responses. I would add new choices to make it more plentiful for what I was doing. Update image gives me the option to, well, to put an image as the actual background. And then these are the words that you can just drag around to wherever you want it to evaluate on the picture. So um, I don't, I don't want to go too much into detail um, with some of this. This is where you do the correct answer. And then, you know, once you start getting your feet wet with this, um, once you save it, it wants you to align it to a standard, but you can skip that step. Um, and then you can just assign it through your Google Classroom. And as soon as students log in um, with their Google address, it recognizes them as members of your classroom and it just kind of pulls them into your Edulastic group. And then the kids can start working on the activity right away. Um, so that's, that's my little um, uh, sales pitch, I suppose, for Edulastic. Um, does anybody have any questions about it before we move on? Okay. All right, William, Flipgrid. All right, so for Flipgrid, again, some of the things that you can do, you can ask the students to act out certain sentences, and then you can upload them uh, and view them. Um, and so we actually, um, for the Texas State Junior Classical League last fall, or last, sorry, last spring when pandemic canceled our state conference, um, we asked the students to submit their memorized performances and we viewed them that way. And so it was really cool to see the kids saying Latin and still be able to do some of those things. Um, but you, you can ask them to submit videos, you can limit the length of videos, um, but you know, just tell them to give you a reflection. So some, one of the things that we had talked about earlier in the chat is is the rereading and the pre-reading um, and then provide feedback and this again I realized that asking them to submit something may be adding screen time but sometimes just tell them to go hey why don't you go outside <laughs> sit by a tree and then do this I mean we want them to go outside I mean we've been stuck in our homes <laughs> for so long that some of them have forgotten what it looks like outside mm -hmm. and so that's one of the things that Flipgrid is super super great for. Yeah, and Flipgrid is an app, so it can be on their phone. So you know, there's really no reason why they can't go outside and do something, you know, in the, the regular air, not the processed air. This yeah. is one of my favorite things to ask students to read to their parents or read to me. Um, and you can see where they're struggling. You can see where their hangups are. Just read a paragraph from whatever story you choose out of whatever um, stage you happen to be in. It's so fun to watch. Um, it, it's a real pleasure to get an opportunity for them to relate to their parents too. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Do you mind if I just touch on one other thing about Flipgrid? Um, so I, I had written this thing here too about um, asking students to sort of like reflect on their experience and using that as a form of assessment. Um, so what I've done in the past is, you know, you give a you give a worksheet in class, right? And the kids work on it. So what I've done is I've given the answer key to said worksheet in part of the Flipgrid um, queue. So they have to log on to Flipgrid, and only when they get to the point of the video itself, of like the recording of the video, only when they get that to that point do they get to look at the answer key. But then I want them to record themselves when they're looking at the answer key and when they're seeing. Um, what the answers are, because I want them to have a reaction that says, oh, wow, you know, like, I, I really need to work on my third declension answers, because it seems like I got most of those wrong. I did pretty well with first declension endings. So, you know, I guess I'm really happy that my middle school teacher did a good job with that. But, you know, so just to kind of elicit their, um, their own, like, you know, self cognizance about the process. And I think that that's a really great tool for evaluation as assessment. And the students can comment on each other's as well. Yes. Okay, um, this I think is a really, really helpful um, off the radar tool to put in your toolbox. Your Hamiltonian world right now is upside down with the <laughs> pandemic. And um, this is a perfect time for you to start thinking about what do you want your students to take away from your class? Um, I have measurable and unmeasurable goals. There is not a school that I'm aware of that wants, that, that will tell you that they are against differentiated instruction. 
that uh, their mission statement is like, we would like to test the heck out of kids until they hate school. I, I, those are not school mission statements. School mission statements are lofty. Lean on your school mission statement. If your school gives you pushback on this, um, it's an opportunity for you to say, here's what I want my kids to get out of my class. Here's how it matches up with your ideals. And if you lean on those things and talk about equity and differentiation, you've got a really strong argument for why you might consider using standards-based grading. Traditional assessments typically look like this. This is what I did for the first 10 years of my teaching, paper, quiz, test, um, et cetera. Um, I also taught English and philosophy, by the way, that's why paper's in there, um, or if people uh, teach AP Latin. Um, but this is how I think about assessing now, and I will never, ever, ever go back to a traditional form. I want, most importantly, to, to emphasize that assessing is about feedback. It's not about evaluation. You have an evaluative component, and you can replace that each time you and the student are communicating with one another about what they know. Um, this, I think, is what we do when I have some specific unknown objectives for you to achieve. I'm giving you a quiz. What is the quiz assessing? If the quiz is assessing definitions of vocabulary and parts of speech or tenses or whatever, um, but the grade is just vocab, what is that telling students? So if I give a vocab quiz, I break those things down, maybe into derivatives or maybe into prefixes and suffixes, those kinds of things. So my students very clearly know what skills are helpful to them. Put this in your back pocket now. You don't have to redo everything or really anything, but just think about how you're celebrating what you want in your class to be forward. So um, now I have a series of objectives. You can do um, free assessment jump rope. When I taught in India, I set up um, students with jump rope. Uh, well, I set the teachers up with jump rope. The students didn't have access to um, seeing grades, but it was a way for them to monitor how successful kids were doing so that they could go to the government in India and say, look, our kids are really learning to read and the kids knew how to read in six, seven, eight languages. Um, but Power School is attached. It's Power School haiku, some, I don't know what it's called anymore. It's a merge of the two, but it has an option on there and you can ask your, um, your administration to turn that on um, in the LMS. And SVG book is what I'm using right now, which I'm really thrilled with. This is um, a list that I give my students. I want my students to love reading in and out of class. This is assessment. This is the Cambridge Latin course. And if we can do these kinds of things, I think it really has uh, an opportunity for kids to walk away saying, yay, Latin, instead of, oh, pandemic, as um, Stephanie and William have talked about earlier. Um, I want them to think very carefully about um, how cultures um, treated other people. I want them to become empathetic and I want them to listen to each other. Do I give them a grade on this? Heck no. Do I want them to know that I'm giving them feedback on their love of reading? Tell me about it. Are you excited about it? We can swap stories. That's what I want. Um, this is just a, a section. Um, to me, this is the heart of what um, I'm doing in my class. So I independently read and reread. That's a primary objective for my class. They do assess themselves and I assess them. I ask them to pronounce Latin. I, I don't expect it to be perfect, but I do want them to um, know when they're missing a syllable or when they're inverting something. It's a very quick way for you as a teacher and for them as students to know, oh, um, dog is not dinner. Um, at least we hope it's not always. My, my dog wouldn't have liked that. So um, anyway, this is a breakdown. I have a vocabulary section. I have a language section. I have a history, culture, and geography section. And I have a separate habits of mind section. Um, this is why we're doing it. For equity, for differentiated instruction, um, to support a growth mindset. All of these things that you are already doing in your classroom. If you are interested in putting this into practice, it's so simple. Don't let it bog you down and reach out to people who are already doing this. Um, you have my email in um, at the end of this and I would be happy, love to talk to you more about this. Um, the more people that I 
can chat with about um, putting this in your academic assessment toolkit, the stronger your argument will be for helping support kids in their learning. This to me is more important than any, um, any kahoot that I could ever do with my kids. Yes, and just kind of echoing on what Sammy has said, our, the Cambridge stories are so rich. Um, and when the kids really get into the reading and show their love of reading, it's amazing to see what they're able to do, um, even in this pandemic time. Um, you know, the kids had such great time putting the, we're in Latin 2 pre-AP, we're working on stage 22, the Amor Omnia Winkit story. It's so much fun to see the students collaborate and come up with a, a way to present um, their, their the different scenes and doing different things um, and how much they really get into it. And I think that's ultimately our goal is to get them excited about reading Latin and, and take ownership, right? Um, and, you know, definitely we're assessing all the time, but we also need to evaluate and provide that feedback for the students. That's the only way that they can grow, so. And if you do this, you can still give traditional quizzes and tests. My students, I gave a, a vocabulary quiz on a Google form, it ten, first 10 minutes of class, and they said, just show me what you know. It is a comfort, I think, for me to, for my administrators, for my colleagues to know, are you giving vocabulary quizzes? Yes, I am. That is a checkbox. I am giving them a grade, but it's also a reassurance for them to know it's okay if they make a mistake and they can do it again. 